In the ancient capital of Vilnius, Lithuania, it is not unusual to encounter a street musician, but it is surprising to hear him playing the national anthem of another country, Ukraine. Sympathy and support for Ukraine is visible all around the city. There are fundraising collection boxes everywhere, even in the famous St. Casimir Church. Lithuania has welcomed a wave of refugees from Ukraine and also from Russia, including former Russian government officials like Vladimir Milov, who is now working against the Putin regime. Milov once served as a deputy minister of energy back when Russia seemed to be moving on a democratic path. He left Moscow 14 months ago to escape arrest. We are very, very different uh, from any of the previous waves of immigration in uh, Russian history because we are aiming at coming back. And we have a political plan for Russia, which is changing the public opinion, turning it against Putin, weakening the system, and through this uh, bringing about change. Milov broadcasts his political analysis into Russia via YouTube, which hasn't yet been blocked. So we understand that there are many, many people in Russia who need us, need our work. We're doing something which is strongly in demand. So that, uh, you know, on the background of all these, you know, grim things happening, that is something that still encourages us. When Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny returned to Russia after recovering in Germany from the attempt to poison him, he was immediately arrested. He has now been convicted of a trumped-up charge and sentenced to nine years. Meanwhile, his political organization has moved out of the country to Vilnius, where it is led by Leonid Volkov. From the very first day of the war, we have launched an operation here in Vilnius with daily news uh, about the war, like a real media operation. The Navalny YouTube channel carries five to six hours of programming every day and claims an audience of 12 million viewers in Russia. I, I believe it's the largest independent media in Russia now. And of course, like, it's, it's very important because in the very first day of the war, Putin has completely censored away and shut down all independent media that existed inside the country. And he already had some infrastructure in place outside the country. So we were able like, to jump in and, and to fill this vacuum. We want to bring about uh, that moment, make it closer, when people will start openly questioning the system, questioning Putin's policy. In December 2021, Russian journalist Dmitry Muratov was the co-winner of the Nobel Peace Prize with Marie Ressa of the Philippines. They were honored for their battle to keep free expression alive under oppressive regimes. Just days after the Ukraine war began, Vladimir Putin effectively banned all independent media in Russia. And so Dmitry Muratov announced he was suspending publication of his newspaper, Novaya Gazeta. In early April, Muratov was attacked and sprayed with dye as he traveled near Moscow on a train. The attacker yelled that he was supporting Russian troops. American intelligence later announced that the attacker, who escaped, was traced to the Russian government. I'm over $100 million. Fair warning. Is there anybody else in this room or the world? On June 20th in New York City, Muratov auctioned off his Nobel medal Done! Uh, over a hundred million dollars. Which he donated to UNICEF to aid Ukrainian children hurt in the war. Now Muratov's newspaper Novaya Gazeta has set up operations in Riga, Latvia where Kirill Martinov is editor-in-chief. 
tend to be totally separate from Nova Gazeta in Moscow for security reasons, because if we have any connections, legal or financial or something like this, it's too dangerous for those people who are still in Russia for now, because we don't, we don't follow uh, any Russian censorship. Isn't it still dangerous for your staff in Russia? It, it's become, this shadow journalism become a very dangerous profession for now. In Riga, rabid opposition to Putin is everywhere. This giant altered portrait of him is on a wall of a government building facing the Russian embassy, accompanied by a photo exhibit of Russian war crimes committed in Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine. In Vilnius, the Russian embassy looks out on a huge sign suggesting Putin will be tried at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. In your view, is Putin strong or is he weak? Uh, there is no vision. We're not going anywhere. We're stuck. We like, uh, you know, we are uh, like a Titanic, uh, which is still afloat after hitting the iceberg. And if you saw the movie, there were even some people who were playing football with the chunks of ice and, and having their fun but just for a few hours. So I think that's the me metaphor which uh, reflects it all. As that's a big, strong mechanism, but it will sink because of the physics. Among the expatriate community in the Baltics, you will often hear comparisons of Vladimir Putin to Adolf Hitler. They also speak of Klaus von Staffenberg, the German officer who attempted to assassinate Hitler in 1944 with a bomb and a briefcase. He failed and was himself executed. I don't see any member of Russian elite who would be happy about what's going on. Now, is it enough for them to form some kind of like alliance to try to get rid of Putin is there like a new uh, Stauffenberg? We don't know and we can't measure it. But, well, this is my political gut feeling that something's going to happen uh, with the Russian elite. Right now people are afraid, but they will become less afraid and uh, problems will mount on a very serious level. So people will start talking openly. At some point, when people talk, 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 everybody stops being afraid. Even still that you have all these repressive apparatus, but at some point people stop being afraid. In Latvia, a former Russian KGB headquarters building has been converted into a museum where residents and visitors can see evidence of severe Russian oppression through the years of Soviet occupation, complete with dungeons and execution chambers where bullets are still embedded in the walls. The stories and photos of the victims are catalogued. All of this to show why the Baltic states are so determined to counter Russian aggression and why they are providing a welcome to the Russian exiles determined to fight Vladimir Putin. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Riga.